but basically each body has male and female aspects you know and we know this from chromosome study and this is actually the foundation of tantra is that we have male and female both and so it's almost like we have a magnetic setup in our bodies and through that magnetic it's like in a magnet and through that um we we can circulate energy in our own bodies and it's really that circulation of energy in your own body that leads to blissful experiences I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today, our guest is Diana Richardson. Diana is considered to be one of today's leading authorities on human sexuality. She is the best selling author of eight books on how, in practical ways, a person can experience a more fulfilling sex and love life. Some of her books include The Heart of Tantric Sex, Slow Sex, Tantric Sex for Men, Tantric Orgasm for Women, as well as a TED Talk on the power of mindful sex. Born in South Africa, she first qualified as a lawyer and then she trained as a holistic massage therapist. Her interest in the body and healing prompted an intense personal exploration into the union of sex and meditation. Since 1993, together with her partner, Michael, She has been sharing her insights and experiences with couples to participate in their Making Love Retreats in Switzerland, where Diana and Michael are based. So in this context, how would you define Tantra? Essentially, you know, the word Tantra is from Sanskrit language, and it means expansion of energy, expansion of consciousness. And that, you know, can lead to blissful states. And and many of us have had that experience uh, of blissfulness, but it's always to do with an expansion. So, you know, essentially, if we look at our what I call conventional sex, it's more about compression than expansion. You know, we get very tense, we get very uh, fixed in our ideas, what we want, where we want to go. And that tends to dominate us or uh, lead the way rather than, um, you know, just being in the body and, and seeing what unfolds through the body. So essentially, it's about expansion of uh, energy and realizing that conventionally, we compress it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, actually, ultimately, we do discharge that vitality. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, in very, very simple terms. I know some people can give really highfalutin (laughs) ideas, but, you know, that's just not my style. (laughs) What was the process of starting to experiment with and teach Tantra? Well, you know, I'm, I'm now 68 soon, and, and I started when I was very early 30s. I had listened to two talks uh, by Barry Long um, from Australia called Making Love, and those were just so interesting. And then also I had read some material from uh, the spiritual master Osho. And it was a combination of these two things, these two sources of inspiration, quite different sources. Um, what just made me curious. Uh, you know, I, I had I enjoyed sex. I wasn't aware of having any problems or limitations and so on. The other thing is I was a body person. You know, I studied law, all that, wanted to become a lawyer in South Africa because of apartheid and somehow support you know the prejudice the oppressed people um anyway that didn't work out and i got into the body so essentially i've been a, a body therapist most of my life and that interest in the body um and and different techniques you know of, of you know deep tissue and kinesiology and uh, classic massage and so on it just made me very curious about sex and so i started to you know in practice with a partner integrate little tips 
you know, or little guidelines. And I was just amazed how it really changed my perception and um, how I actually felt in myself, you know, as a person, not even as a woman. Um, and I just felt much more present, much more grounded, uh, less outward going, more inward feeling. And, you know, I, I really experimented over like five, six years and, and a lot. And again and again, I, I saw, oh, okay, I, I got validation, you know, like if I do, <laughs> in inverted commas, such and such, this is the, the by, byproduct. And again and again, putting these little things into practice, um, yeah, it just changed the whole way I make love, the whole way, you know, I saw myself, how I saw women, how I saw men, how I related to both uh, genders. So it really, and then also how I saw sex, it was just like another world. Mm -hmm. And th this, you know, I was living in a, a big community actually in India at the time, and then people, I did, I kept it very quiet, but people started just kind of organically coming to me and asked, talk to me about sex. I mean, I had no idea why. And I found I could talk about it. And also I had been a bodywork teacher and I was used to talking about the body. So transposing the different body parts, you know, from shoulders and neck to genitals and so on, you know, it was, it was very easy and I felt very natural in it. And that kind of led step by step to my uh, offering seminars and, you know, actually bringing couples together for a residential week and um, yeah, putting all these little pieces in a sequence uh, for people to, to try and experiment. So the whole thing was very organic. And then, you know, like around 1995, 1996, I decided when I hadn't done a lot of teaching at that point, I decided just for fun to see, is it possible to put body sensitivity in experiences into words and so that was actually the motivation for my first book does this transmit you know into words and um so that's how the book writing started mm -hmm. and you know especially that my first book the heart of tantric sex um you know it was really from that place of like okay what is this about and um you know, can one share these little fine details? And and so the whole thing is just um, unfolded from there. And, you know, that I'm sitting here to do today uh, talking to you. You know, it's just really, you know, it's just beautiful uh, surprise of life and um, totally unexpected. So, you know, very, very clearly I've not had any goal, either in the way I have sex or the fact that I've become a person whose no name is... Um, <laughs> recognized or you know associated with an alternative style of love making mm. oh it's so beautiful to hear all of that I love the organic process and it's interesting too because your first book has everything in it it's like you already had the full transmission right. in the beginning because it feels like all of your books then like pull from some of those really fundamental teachings so it's interesting so early on you had this framework Yes, yes. Um, and that's true. And, you know, essentially, all my books contain the same material. It's just from different angles, you know, the female angle, the male angle, um, different angles. But yes, I've always felt that, that actually that, that first book said it all. But yeah. then publishers say to you, what about a book for women? And you go, yeah, why not? Okay. And then after you've done it for women, they say, what about one for men? And you go, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's been really fun. Um, so I'd love to speak about the topic of relaxation. This is my favorite part of your work. I mean, it's just so fundamental in everything that you share about. Relaxation is, you know, really fundamental because if you look at how we are in our bodies, insects, but also in our lives in general, we are very tense. And when the physical structure is tense, it contains the body energy. There's no possibility, you know, for, uh, for expansion, you know, on a subtle level of, of body vitality. So it is, it's really an umbrella 
over all the little tips and, and guidelines that I give. But the main thing about relaxation, it doesn't mean collapse. And many people think relaxation is just like checking out, but actually it's checking in, mm -hmm. you know, checking into your body, scanning your body, jaw, shoulders, belly, pelvic floor, even your feet or any body part and observing if it's tense and relaxing. And of course, this requires awareness. So this is where, you know, like awareness is the, the basic, basic ground is starting to pay attention to your body in the here and now and starting to soften. Um, and like, you know, the more you kind of do that, you become more inside your body. So people often think relaxation, like I said, is just like collapsing and spacing out. But the more you relax and are conscious with it, uh, the more the, the field expands, um, the more you can perceive and, and uh, the more present you are. So, you know, it's relaxation, awareness and presence. And essentially in, in you know, mainstream sex or conventional sex, um, we are not very present. Uh, and this is because the, the basic difference between tantric sex, as I know it, and, you know, conventional sex is that conventional sex is really oriented on the peak experience. So, of course, you know, there's a lot of tension involved in that. You know, you're kind of ahead of yourself. You're working towards that. You're trying to build up intensity, trying to build up a sensation to bring it to a peak. Whereas, you know, the, the tantric style is more to stay in the present and stay in the present and stay in the present and not head in any direction. Because the moment you head in any direction, you get tense. You know, you, you tense up your shoulders, you tense up your bum, your bottom, you tense up your genitals. Um, so it's really the goal orientation that is the, you know, the problem, let's say, in conventional sex. And, you know, that leads to further problems. It, in the case of men, it leads to um, performance stress, huge performance stress. You know, to get an erection, keep an erection, keep up the excitement. Women, we join in to try and sustain all that. And um, women also, because we have this goal and everybody wants to be happy to have this peak, hopefully together, that women then stand, tend to start to please men. And things are happening inside their bodies that they doesn't feel quite right. Mm -hmm. But we just like pretend or smile or, you know, just, just keep going because we, we have this idea where we want to get. So, so men have a lot of performance pressure and women, women also have performance pressure, but it's at a much lower level. But more us is this, um, you know, a pleasing factor. So we don't really say, wow, that hurts or can you stop for a little bit or that feels a little bit um, full on for my body. And often, you know, these things with that, that women feel in the body, it's not really psychological. It can sometimes have a, a relationship to previous traumatic experiences, but it's more as women, we don't like to speak out about what suits us because we're so much into making the man happy, keeping love alive, you know, or keeping the relationship going. So there's a lot of that cross threads, you know, happening. Uh, whereas, you know, in the tantric approach, it's more about, you know, uh, staying here and now and not making so much effort, mm -hmm. uh, being more conscious, uh, aware of what you are doing. Um, like in conventional sex, the sex, there's a lot of mechanicalness, uh, you know, and it gets more and more mechanical the closer you get to the peak. And actually, if you really look, the closer you get, the more tense you get, the less you can feel. Um, yeah, so this thing of trying to stay present and just letting the, the thing unfold with staying in your body and see where it goes. If you don't come to a peak, 
it's also really, really fine. You feel great. Um, but the psychology, uh, our psyches are like, we've got to have this big explosion. But actually, when we do explode or have this peak, there is a, a discharge. And then, you know, with men, it's classic. You know, there's this loss of energy. They go a little into withdrawal. Um, we know the jokes, you know, men turning over and, and snoring. And But it is a reality. Uh, and also women also experience a loss of energy. You know, it's so weird, this thing that you were like totally plugged into and there was nothing more imp important. Uh, suddenly, you know, you peak and it's over and you go like, what was all that about? So women, you know, often feel like a bit lonely or abandoned. So they can't, they often after effects from the peak experience that we don't really notice because the whole attention is on the peak. So we don't really look at, well, how do I feel after the peak? And it might not even be immediately after the peak. There might be a, a immediate um, feeling of, you know, relaxation, but actually it's more like loss of tension. It's not true relaxation. Um, some people feel energized. So it's, you know, I mean, it's important to say for me that I do speak in generalizations because other people will have contrary experiences. But from my personal experiences and the experience of many thousands of people I've worked with, generally speaking, you know, it, it's really true that after this peak, there is this um, falling down. And I have, you know, since then come to understand it's also hormonally connected. Um, but I'm not really a hormone person, so I can't name them. I always forget them. <laughs> But it's like you have a snort of Coke or something and you go, wow, and then something else happens after. You know, it's the same kind of uh, hormonal situation. But I, I think that the hormones are not important. I mean, they are. But it's more how we can work with the awareness and being more conscious and to see how that changes our way of being or our understanding and it sounds to you like what you're sharing would be accessible for anybody, regardless of their sexual orientation, these, these principles of relaxation. Um, yes, Olivia, this is so important to mention because, you know, obviously over, since when I started and actually wrote a lot of my books, the, the whole, um, yeah, you know, I'm heterosexual. And so it really stems, you know, my experiences from that, but in 1993, actually, I worked with a group of men, couples, who were all AIDS positive. And my friend who was working with these men, she said, please, you know, it's so important that these men get a, a positive kind of sense of, of what's possible. And that was didn't mean between man and woman, but just like in the awareness. So it was really through that that I was like, I spent a weekend with these guys and it was like, it works for every gender, every combination. It's really this, this um, thing about uh, awareness. Any two people, like you say, can be more relaxed, can be more conscious, can be less mechanical, can be more present. Of course, there is a difference in the way the genitals um, you know, interact, but, you know, like I did a TED talk and, and I just said, I had to state it there very clearly, you know, general principles, like you say, apply, but um, some adjustments have to be made. And, and I do feel that this is really something that I look forward to hearing more from these other um, groups of people, their experience. And hopefully they write some books or do some workshops <laughs> yeah definitely and, and what does it look like exactly if you're in a sexual exchange to reduce the amount of physical effort in your actual you know practice together um you know it's you still move your body you know or say in the case of of heterosexuals they're still you know moving in and out of the penis in the vagina but it's not this hectic 
you know, it's more you feel the in, you feel the out, you feel, whereas normally we're so busy orienting on where we want to get to that we're actually not really that conscious. So one is still, you know, moving the body and, you know, you change positions and, but everything is just much more slow. And actually I did write a book called Slow Sex and, um, you know, slowness is a byproduct of consciousness, of awareness. So it's not like you go slow, but if you're aware, just very spontaneously and organically, you slow down and there's less physical effort. Uh, so, yeah. And, and anybody who tries will, will perceive that. It's just like, oh, I'm not working so hard because you're not working towards something. You're just using your body in a way that holds you in the present. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in the same vein, we you also, you, you touched on it a little bit, but I'm curious a little bit more, the, the notion of seeking sensitivity rather than sensation, just the differentiation between the two. Yes. And, and this is important because what we are used to is sensation and intensity. And so, because that we definitely feel, mm-hmm. but the more sensation you have, the less you actually feel. And, you know, if people just keep going, keep going, keep going for sensation, ultimately there is, uh, you you stop feeling because there's only so much sensation the body can handle. So sensitivity is about uh, working on your senses and starting to give value to the subtle. So we only give subtle to, uh, sorry, attention to the, intensity and that feels better and better and better but the flip side of that is just dropping into your body feeling and starting to observe the very small things that are are happening in the body and that is your life you know your senses are your life so sensation is something overlaid over our our intrinsic senses um so that you know that is a journey to shift also from sensation giving value to small things because the small things are like seeds you know and if you keep feeding them with your awareness then these things can uh, expand and grow in the body and actually cool uh, a lot of healing can happen through that mm-hmm. you know old tensions can leave the body old memories can leave the body so it's a very healing experience or Tantra is sometimes known as a process of um, purification. So it really, you know, tears can come up shivering and shaking. But if one understands what is happening, that this is your body releasing tensions. I mean, I'm always amazed, um, you know, in the workshops, how quickly people start to feel this purification. And, you know, some of the byproducts are, you know, you get a headache. Well, that's the body detoxing. Sometimes you might feel nauseous. That's the body detoxing. Sometimes there's, you actually vomit. And not so often, but, you know, you get that feeling. And even just to make that gag reflex releases a whole lot of tension from the body. Some people get diarrhea. It doesn't last for long, but it's just how quickly the body, when there's, consciousness and awareness you know in the whole thing that whole sexual vitality it starts to heal the body because we all you know i mean it is so sad that so many people are traumatized through sex but even if one is fortunate enough not to be heavily traumatized we've all had challenging experiences and these little memories are stored you know in in the cells so, you know, things kind of start to, to flow out of the body in order to increase our, well, not in order, but and as a result, then we um, are more sensitive. This healing that comes from that slowness and just that, that meeting of one and another, because so often we think we're with somebody and we don't get that time of, of um, whether it is the genitals meeting or or it is um, just that really slow presence. There's something, yeah, so deeply transformative. And everybody is kind of longing 
mm-hmm. you know, for that space. But we don't even know we're longing. But when we taste it, it's just like, oh, you know, this this is what nourishes me. And, you know, even that you might not have like a sensational experience. Afterwards, you just feel good. And the other beautiful thing is that awareness generates love. So the more aware you are and, you know, just with each other, around each other, how you embrace, how you communicate with each other. Uh, these are, um, you know, th- this is how love starts to, to manifest, you know, and how you can support love through physical interaction. You know, like I said, not only sex, but um, just being gentle and loving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So can you also speak about staying in the cool zone and, and how yeah. what, what that even means for, you know, both a female and male bodied human? You know, well, basically, you know, in as we understand sex, but actually, you know, to understand we also are imprinted, you know, we are sexually conditioned. It's all about raising the temperature, getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And the reality is, is that men in particular cannot hold that heat that very easily leads to premature ejaculation. And so men think there's something wrong with them. Women think there's something wrong with the guy. Um, But it's actually all about the sexual temperature. So in our minds, we have this got to be more intense, more hot. um, But then the whole thing just blows blows out, you know. Um, And then for men, that leads to a lot of insecurity. Mm which then makes it even more difficult then to, you know, it will support insecurity, will make a man um, ejaculate prematurely. And a lot of self-doubt that they're not man enough, but if you reduce sexual temperature and stay more in the present and feel everything without this idea of I've got to get hot and bring it up to a a peak. Um, So this is why, you know, this idea of temperature is to keep it cool. And cool is not cold, you know, but just like a a relax, man, you know, take it easy, stay here. And in that sense, you know, some things like, which we might talk about later anyways, about having eye contact, you know, keeps you more present. Um, Also having eyes open, there's less fantasy. And, you know, the main reason, there's nothing wrong with fantasy, but it's, you're not really here. And it's always going to be the fantasizing about something provocative or something stimulating that makes you more hot. You know, so when I talk about the cool zone, it's just like, you know, relaxing and, and, and just being here and letting each, well, if we're talking about man and woman, you know, like each penetration be unto itself, mm-hmm. not like a step for the next, for the next, for the next, because that's actually, as man and woman, we're always interested in the next penetration, not really this one, because the next one brings you closer to where you're trying to reach. So, yeah, if you keep it cool and aware, the whole thing just comes down to ground and becomes much more innocent, much more sweet, you know, and fulfilling. We are not educated, generally speaking, about how to be in our bodies, just how we walk, how we stand, how we sit. I mean, I'm amazed when I look at how people move around. There's nobody home. You know, it's more like we're always in thought and and not really in our bodies. So if you're more in you, you know, the, the art is to be more inside your body. And I think if we were more body connected, Uh, we would perceive these things. So I think it's part to do with imprinting, you know, which happens on an unconscious level from very early years. But it is true that, you know, a lot of people lack touch from very early in their their lives. You know, I lived in India where people are touching each other the whole time. Um, Even that it's a society that is not at all open about sex and I'm talking about currently, I mean, Tantra does have its roots in in India, but these are very small pockets. Uh, 
but the people are really they really touch you can get a massage from anybody everybody knows to massage it's not like they went to a massage school but they know how to touch the body um yeah and they start massaging babies from very young and really boom 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 you know incredible i've seen them a few month old babies and warm 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 and you know it really just helps the the child to like if there's been any birth tensions or but it helps the child to come in the body so you know i come from south africa and there actually we really are we we touch people but as i've moved around the world and particularly now where i live in switzerland you don't touch somebody and and i forget you know i'm a friendly person i touch somebody <laughs> so i've really learned to i have to like you know withdraw and behave myself keep my eyes down <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So we do all lack touch, and many, you know, so many people just didn't have touch as children. And for men in particular around ejaculation, will you speak on ejaculation control versus non ejaculation, the difference between the two? Yes, it's a very, very big difference and an important difference. And I'm grateful that you, you bring it up because um, ejaculation control is not healthy in the sense of, um, you know, even if you read Taoist books and so on, it's about, you know, you, you bring the, the intensity up to almost the point of no return and then you relax and then you bring it up and then you relax and then you bring it up and then you relax. And ultimately what you're doing is you're playing with tension. And this repressing of the tension uh, causes a lot of congestion in the body. You know, particularly, uh, you know, in the prostate area, in the testicles. So if a man does ejaculation control, it is quite probable that after having sex, he might have uh, pains, you know, somewhere like in the groin or, like I said, the testicles, sometimes even in the penis. Um, so we say don't control. If you come to the point that you, you want to come or coming is happening, let it happen. Just let it through, you know, celebrate, enjoy. Non-ejaculation is when you stay in the cool zone and you don't come to the point of wanting to ejaculate. So it's, it's two very different things. And then if, you know, you move out of the cool zone and suddenly ej ejaculation wants to happen, then you let it happen. So um, they're two different worlds, and that's why this idea of sexual temperature, you know, is important. And it's not something you can say, like, that is the point where the temperature changes. Each one has to find out for themselves. But, you know, non-ejaculation is a perfectly viable uh, way to go ahead. Uh, and many, you know, I, around me are many men who don't you know, through my own personal experience and, and people who have been working with me, and they feel so well, you know, because the vitality is contained. And then it inverts and, you know, expands um, through the body. So ultimately, non-ejaculation is empowering. And, you know, conventionally, doctors say, you know, you have to come every now and then just to kind of keep the pipes clean. But it's it's not... It's not a reality. They, they understand sex from, you know, the conventional perspective, because only that, as I understand it, and what I hear from men, only that what is released is reproduced, you know, or replaced rather. So, and it doesn't mean to say you can't ever come, but you can have that as a style, and it is totally fulfilling. And, um, you know, for women also. It's a little different in the sense of most women, they work for their orgasm. Um, and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of women do have difficulty to, to get to a peak. They can't raise the, the tension and intensity and they think there's something wrong with them, but actually it's, it's all okay. Um, a woman is also possible for her to have an orgasm without any effort that it just radiates through the body. And that kind of orgasm, that will not pull an ejaculation from a man. 
But if a woman goes really into the hot zone and starts, you know, pumping or working for it, that very easily causes a man to, to ejaculate. Um, so as women, you know, the more cool and, and aware and conscious we can be, we can also support men very much to stay in the cool zone and also to, to, to step back from that um, ejaculation pattern. And, you know, there's, like I say, again, it's not, there's nothing wrong with ejaculation. I mean, you know, it's reproduction. The thing is we've made a habit of it and that's what we want. And that's what we long for. And, uh, you know, we have it. And as soon as we've had it, we want it again. So it really just reflects that it's not a circular fulfillment where it's like, oh, now I feel really nourished because you all, you know, you don't actually, aside from a few moments of intensity, you don't, it's not fulfilling. And this is why again and again, wanting the same thing. So it's more about the habit than actual ejaculation per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and would you share too about the this myth of the tight vagina is what equates to good sex for women? Yes. Well, first let me say that many, many, many women have pain during sex. And that is one thing they will never tell a man that it's painful. And, and this is part of our pleasing thing. And some women really from the first time they make love or it, as they get older, and certainly during menopause, pains happen. Um, but yes, we, you know, if we think of conventional sex and, you know, the in and out, what we, we, we call friction, um, of course, if the vagina is held tighter, which many of we do consciously, we hold it tight, you know, or we do little squeezes, that's all to raise sensation and intensity it doesn't help us to feel more mm. but uh whereas the vagina you know if you look at the penis he's a, a channel and if you look at the vagina she's a canal so you have these two things that fit into each other whereas one transmits and the other one receives so the more more relaxed and open and the more a woman has her awareness in her vagina, the more capable she is of actually absorbing and receiving um, male vitality into her. And very important to say is that receptivity is not passivity. Uh, and that's a mistake, you know, in people's minds, oh, now I've just got to lie there. But receptivity is a force mm. and it can draw uh, receptivity can draw a man into this a space of being more present and it can also help to absorb and draw the male vitality you know into the female body but if we're holding it tight and narrow you know it's just then again mechanical it's very physical it doesn't touch um, energetically you say more about that receptivity. What does it look like? What is <laughs> women inhabiting actively that receptivity? Well, look, even if you look at how people hug. Now, if you look at movies, which I do very much, uh, you see two people come on each other, you know, kissing or something. It's like people are eating each other up, you know? Whereas if a woman just holds her presence and um, yeah, just holds an, an awareness in the body and softens and relaxes. It um, energy flows towards her. So receptivity is not something you do; it's something you be, and you are that anyway, as by virtue of being a woman. Um, so it's to be more conscious in your body, and that changes the whole atmosphere. Um, because it's almost like woman is a surrounding and man moves through that space. Um, you know, as far as the vagina goes, is to um, not tighten it and invest it rather with the awareness. Mm -hmm. Because the penis is actually very perceptive. You know, the head of the penis is like a very intelligent magnet and it can feel. 
it can feel different things in the vagina. But if we're holding it tight and the whole emphasis is on friction and sensation and intensity, we bypassing or not bypassing, but we are engaging on a relatively superficial level. Mm. Whereas the body is capable of much, much more, but our minds are dominating the whole thing. Mm. So, you know, when you say receptivity, how does it look? It's just like, there's not so much physical effort. There's not so much contraction, but certainly what you feel, you know, like if a woman just holds her space and a man comes to hug her, instead of like going up and out on the guy, just to hold her in a space, a whole different kind of exchange happens. Yeah. So, yeah, receptivity is not passivity. Um, you're actively uh, in there, but you are not being demonstrative. Would you share about innocence? You use this term innocence and what you also call the love keys and their place in perception and practice. Well, the thing is, is if you do all these things that we've been talking about, you're just naturally more innocent. You know, it's just a byproduct. If you're more present, if you're more aware, if you're more relaxed, if you're not on any kind of um, program or agenda, which we usually are, you just feel more natural. You just feel more innocent. And I often ask in the workshops, I mean, it's amazing. And within three days, you can see people just look totally different. But who feels, you know, by the end, I'm saying, uh, who feels just that they're much more innocent? Everybody puts up their hands because they connected more to their essence. So like this thing of innocence and sweetness, it's more like a byproduct, an outcome of, yeah, you know, being more aware, more present, more relaxed, and not going for, for the goal. Mm -hmm. And what are, you have these beautiful and very useful love keys that are so practical. Would you share yeah. a little bit? I know you probably can't share about all of them, but. No, there's no secrets. I mean, we've said some already. Yeah. A relaxation. One thing I do help people and that's why I don't do any online courses or anything is how to be in their bodies because I can only really do that if they're with me. But, you know, it's, it's like I, I, one of the first things I say to people is just, you know, turn your attention into your body and look around for a place that, that you can feel, you know, and that's easy for you to feel. And, and then that I call home or an anchor point. Most people can can find a place very easily. You know, it's got to be below the head, of course. Um, mm -hmm. But it could be the solar plexus or the low back or the heart or the breasts or it could be anywhere, the perineum. So if you have that as an access point, that whenever you find yourself in thought, you know, which happens, of course, a lot, you know, you you have somewhere like a resource within your body that you can drop to. And this is something that you can do while I'm talking to you, I can do that. While I'm cooking, while I'm driving, uh, while I'm teaching, you know, I'm constantly going back, feeling my body from the inside. So that is a basic step. And people can also figure that out on their own. Um, it's just, I choose not to do at the moment online. Um, so th that, you know, what I call in and down, because we're all a bit up and outside of ourselves. And this comes from a lack of body education. And if there is body education in school, it's more sport and competitive. But, you know, as children, parents are not helping them to be aware in their bodies. Mm. You know, I, I, I live in a road here where the kids here in Switzerland, they walk to school. And uh, from the rucksacks, heavy, huge rucksacks, I can already see how that's affecting their walking, affecting their posture, affecting their alignment. And I see now most of the older people in Switzerland are all way forward in their head, in the shoulders. And nobody thinks, oh, it's because when we were so small for years, we were carrying rucksacks. So um, there needs to be more body awareness you know, generally in our society. Um, so 
one of the first keys is in and down instead of up and out on, on somebody like I was saying, you know, you're like you're eating somebody or you, all your attention's outside. You, you need to come back to the body because the body is the only thing that exists in the present. You know, nothing else. When you talk about the present, it, it, it's what's, what does that mean? It means your body. That's the only thing that is truly present. So that's why the body and having body sensitivity and awareness is so fundamental. So the other one is eye contact. And um, that keeps people also in the here and now. And it's not an eye contact that you're looking out. It's more that you receive through the eyes. And, you know, that's also a practice. You can practice in nature. But as soon as you let things come into your eyes, instead of looking out, as we tend to, you know, you start to see different things. Your eyes are less critical. Uh, you're less prejudiced. So the, it does involve what I call receptive vision. Uh, the other one is relaxation, which means scanning your body head to toe again and again, all through your day and while you're making love. In particular, always check jaw and shoulders and belly. Also your pelvic floor. For men, the anus and the buttocks. For women, relax the vagina. Um, another thing is in movement, uh, you know, like um, instead of mechanical movement, you make always conscious movements and that naturally slows you down. And then once you're slower, you can feel more. Um, communication is very helpful, meaning just sharing with your partner what you feel and where you feel it. Often we kind of guessing. Um, so if, you know, so if something feels good, you say it feels good. And often when you acknowledge something that feels good, it, the inner experience will expand. If something feels like painful, you, you say it's painful and then you stop. It's not like you've done something bad. You know, if a woman says that hurts me, it's not that man must then, you know, it's difficult because it feels like criticism, but that's more of an emotional reaction related to, the rest of the person's life. But if there's pain, the man must just stop and stay. Not like, oh, I've done something wrong and, you know, collapse and, you know, stop having, making love. Um, so the more, you know, the more we can acknowledge what's happening in our body, it's like in one way you're communicating with your partner, but actually, ultimately, you're communicating with yourself. Your brain is telling you, you're informing yourself, and that is so important. Um, of course, the way you communicate just needs to be, you know, not judgmental or blaming. And you always talk about yourself, and you talk about the present, and you do it now. Mm -hmm. um, so that helps to, to inform, you know, to, to keep the thing alive. For, for some people, that feels a bit weird, but clinical. But, you know, these are all just what, what we say again and again in our courses is tools and not rules. I like that. Yeah, another thing is um, breathing, of course, is important. It's a great, the best bridge between from mind to body. Just keep the attention on the breath. And if you can breathe down into the belly, that's good. Nasal breathing makes you more sensitive than mouth breathing. And recently I heard something really interesting is that nasal breathing really, really supports male erection mm. as well as broccoli <laughs> <laughs> or something to do with nitric oxide or something. So that was funny when I heard that. Um, touch, you know, we, we tend to be very um, like insensitive how we touch each other a little bit like too physical rather than you know, we have an energy, you know, a physical body, but we are surrounded by an energy body. So instead of just coming like gunk onto a person's body, just come with more awareness, touch with awareness. And this helps the other person's body to open and expand. You know, if somebody just comes doof, something contracts. Um, of course, a lot of touch in sex itself is a little bit goal oriented where and how we touch. Um, so it's good to touch without any intention. 
Mm. You know, like I'm going to do this to turn her on so that then boom, boom, boom. So, you know, just to really, you know, caress and touch and hold and what else? Um, kissing. Kissing is great. You know, it's wonderful kissing, but we tend, again, to go for the French style. Why it's called French, I have no idea, but the tongue kissing. And, you know, there's nothing really wrong with tongue kissing, but it's not easy to sustain. You know, it is quite tiring. And also it raises sexual temperature. And in fact, only recently I realized they have done experiments with kissing because we advocate lip kissing. Um, but tongue kissing hits or affects the sympathetic nervous system, which is the, the nervous system that fight and flight. Um, whereas lip kissing uh, affects the parasympathetic nervous system, which is about well-being and relaxation. So this I only discovered recently. But lip kissing, the thing is, you can sustain it. And it's not fluffy lip, lips, airy, fairy. It's, you know, let the lip, you relax the mouth, you let the lips connect and be juicy. And you can kiss for ages like this. And it's, it's really beautiful. It's not so tiring, but it's a really lovely connection. Mm. And um, generally to be more porous with each other in relation to each other's bodies and that that um, relates also to what I was saying about touch, not being so dense. So if a man comes down on a woman or a woman comes down on a man during making love, you know, if the woman's on top, usually it's the man, we do suggest women give the guys a chance in the back. Um, not just to come doof on the body, you know, just to come with awareness and immediately there's this porousness and, and subtle energies can exchange. So those are the basic um, love keys mm -hmm. uh, that I can think of right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing about those. And can we go from there just to discuss the subtle energy layers? Because you have, uh, you know, beautiful information about the polarities and magnetic intelligence. But basically each body has male and female aspects, you know, and we know this from chromosome study. And this is actually the foundation of Tantra is that we have male and female both. And so it's almost like we have a magnetic setup in our bodies and through that magnetic, it's like in a magnet and through that, um, we, we can circulate energy in our own bodies. And it's really that circulation of energy in your own body that leads to blissful experiences. Mm. So, you know, like a magnet, it has always a positive pole and a, a negative pole. And by negative, I don't mean negative, but we're just using those as symbols. And the fact is that energy, energy can only be raised from a positive pole, not a receptive pole, not a negative pole. And so it's good for individuals to bring attention to their positive pole. Mm. But in men, it's different to in women. With men, the positive pole is in the breasts. That's her energy raising pole. And this is a big shift in understanding about sex because with women, it's very much on the clitoris and trying to get women uh, excited from there. But it's a very different level. If, if um, the energy is open from the breasts, and I'm not talking about breast stimulation or nipple twisting or anything like this. It's just bringing awareness, women can hold her breasts, man can hold her breasts, but just to get women to inhabit their breasts more. And when you do that, and we suggest, you know, women to do every day, like, or whenever, 20 minutes, just hold the breasts and go inside. Because a lot of women don't have access to their breasts. We see them more from the outside. We don't like our breasts. So for women, the energy raising pole is the breasts and nipples. And for men, it's the perineum, which is like the, the base of the penis. So if, you know, on your own, if you're in a partnership or not, you can do meditations 
on these areas. And med meditation just means being present to that part. It's not doing anything. But when one starts to anchor in these areas, then a very subtle energy flow, you know, can start uh, in the body and also ultimately between two bodies. Because in heterosexual sex or bodies, you have two poles meeting, uh, two magnets meeting at opposite ends, and then there is the circling. Um, but, you know, people, we're so impatient. We, we always want to, we now want that goal. You know, now we want that. And instead of just like, let's see what happens and do that for years and suddenly it may happen or not. So it's delicate to talk about those things because suddenly you create new, like I say, goals or ideas for people. But definitely, um, you know, there is this very subtle flowing magnetic flow of energy in the body and you know it's like we replicate the planet the planet is a magnet and the whole cosmos you know it's all on magnetic magnetism so that is something um you know to be aware of yeah yeah and for anyone that has accumulated negative emotion you know i, I think many people as you said earlier there is a lot of trauma on all kinds of levels, but just these blockages to really being with somebody and being with themselves. What do you recommend in terms of releasing some of that? Well, basically to move the body, move the body. You know, if we, <clears throat> excuse me, if we moved our bodies on a more regular basis, we wouldn't be so emotional. We wouldn't be so easy to get, have our buttons pushed. But my partner and I, we wrote this book called Tantric Glove Feeling Versus Emotion. And it's a really, really important way or helpful way to go ahead with when you notice you're emotional because usually when we get emotional or someone pushes our buttons we immediately dump on them and then you've got to fight because somebody else reacts so we all carry unexpressed feelings and the, our emotions are our unexpressed feelings so in our society in most societies um we're not encouraged to express our feelings and even as a young kid one is repressing one's feelings uh, it or what one feels because you need the love of the parents just like you need their food so you know and then different experiences in life you know there's a lot of feelings that are not allowed through um so we all holding a lot and this is even aside if you had very direct uh, sexual trauma so, you know, when that body of emotion gets activated, which can be through the tone of a voice or a little criticism or anything, there, there's some very important indicators that can tell us exactly where we are. And as soon as we go into emotion, we go into disconnection in an instant, almost paralyzed, a wall comes down. Then another indicator is um, you can't look the person in the eyes. Now, the moment you can't look in somebody's eyes, you are emotional. It's just a fact. You know, you'll look everywhere, but not in the eyes. Another one is that you start blaming, making the person responsible for whatever is happening. Meanwhile, actually, in, in reality, it relates to some unexpressed feelings from, could be from childhood. Uh, people like to argue and discuss again and again. People are very self-righteous, an emotional person. They always, an emotional person will try and change the other person. You feel as a victim, you feel abandoned, lonely. I mean, all these different kind of things. What else? I'm just reflecting now. But if you can catch yourself in any, with, through any one of those indicators, then you need to say aloud, I am emotional now. Not time out, not I'm in a bubble, I'm emotional, because that's really hitting the nail on the head. I need some time for myself. And then you go and you move your body, you know, do something consciously, of course, but, you know, really physical, because, it, you know, it's, it's activated in the body, the unexpressed feelings become activated. So then you need to move your body to, to get them out. So a lot of arguments with couples are just, you know, because we don't recognize emotion and take responsibility for it. 
And of course, the other side of the coin is um, start to allow your feelings. If you, if you feel sad, be sad. If you're angry, be angry. Anger is actually very beautiful um, if it's pure. You know, it can save your life. You know, it's just like one raw. But it's repressed anger that's very toxic. And that's the thing about unexpressed feelings <clears throat> or the emotional state is we are very toxic. And that is the problem because more, the more you throw toxins on a love relationship, it becomes very difficult to hold the love. So, you know, to start to allow the feelings, the sadness, the insecurity, um, anger when it's there. So that is an important aspect, which in our courses we teach very much parallel to, to the lovemaking. Because also through the lovemaking, things will come up from the past. So you need to recognize where you are. Um, but that is a very, very helpful tool uh, to start to figure out because it's such a field of confusion, this emotions, um, that people get really mixed up about it. But once you just have this like inside and that it's like this and like this, um, it really, really helps to maintain harmony in a relationship. <laughs>